We're going to start with inception. A startup can begin from any number of ideas, but whether the business adds value, generates wealth, or solves a particular problem, they must serve the consumer first and foremost. And so our first session explores how consumer insight plays a role in an entrepreneur's journey. Every fashion entrepreneur needs a better understanding of the Chinese consumer. Here in China, it is easy to be complacent about Chinese consumers because they seem so familiar. Overseas, Chinese consumers are often misunderstood or misrepresented as a monolith. As LVMH Group President of Greater China, Andrew Wu has an intimate understanding of Chinese luxury consumers and the forces shaping their purchasing decisions. In this session, Mr. Wu will share his valuable insight some of his latest observations and advice to entrepreneurs who are trying to better understand this market and arguably the single most important consumer demographic in our entire fashion industry. So please welcome Andrew Wu. So, so Andrew, um, we were just having lunch and talking about a little bit about your esteemed career here in China as the group president of LVMH. But before we get started on this specific, your specific expertise, I just thought you should share a little bit about your connection to Shanghai and, and China. You've spent time abroad in Canada, but you came back here uh, in 1993 after having grown up here. So maybe just tell us a little bit about your personal background. Well, probably not to waste too much time. Uh, I'm here very much for China, yeah. for BOF, and uh, I'm also here more as a native of China and specifically a native of Shanghai, um, much more than an executive of LVMH. So yes, I think it's an uh, uh, extraordinary uh, um, um, uh, transformation of the country and, and the city. Uh, that I've personally witnessed uh, uh, since, especially since I came back in 1993. Uh, but it's a, a long period of change, and most people probably in this audience are more impressed by what happened in the last five or ten years and probably less, uh, uh, less acquainted with what happened before. So without m wasting time, maybe I would uh, just uh, uh, leave it there and then maybe we can... But I would like to know, mm -hmm. Andrew, like I think for, for those of us who might not be as familiar with mm -hmm. the market as you are, what was the luxury market or the fashion market like here back in 1993? Can you just paint a picture for us? Well, uh, y everybody probably was reading about China's 40 years of economic reform or open door policy that started in 19, late 1978, but actually, actually happening from the beginning of 1979. So this is actually literally the 40th uh, year of change. So in the 80s, as people probably may recall, China was starting to change, but it was changing in terms of trying to become a manufacturing base, export industry, trying to learn from the little four dragons in Asia, uh, build their economies based on export and all that. So that was the 80s, manufacturing, exporting, China being a place of cheap labor, very much. The 90s, especially I think the turning point, if I may, 1993, was the year that the Chinese consumer started to emerge in a very, very small way, little noticed by most people, but it was a very important starting point. I was sharing with people at lunchtime, and then in fact most people probably do not recall that January 1st, 1994 was the moment that China abolished foreign exchange certificate, which was a, a alternative currency that allowed people to buy imported goods. Literally, actually, it was based on hard currency. So hardly anybody had access or, 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 or use uh, of hard currency. So until um, that moment, uh, January 1st, 1994, Imported goods, especially imported uh, luxury goods, uh, in those days probably was just referring to beauty, so cosmetics. It was not really open to uh, real Chinese consumers per se, unless you had relatives with uh, foreign currency or you have a special source of foreign currency. So that was a very good, a very important moment. 
And of course, the consumer base was very small in much of the 90s, and I think it started to probably build its base progressively towards the end of the 90s, but a, a, a probably a moment of another turning was when China joined WTO, which was 2002. That was a moment, actually a year after, foreign companies, especially re retail brands, like luxury brands, uh, started to be able to acquire um, direct operating licenses. So that was another moment, and that was a moment of very, uh, very great importance because it was a moment to see uh, the visibility of Chinese consumer to gain in volume. Um, this uh, started a, a second phase. And then, of course, uh, we all know that probably around the Beijing Olympics or Chan Shanghai Expo, the, 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 the momentum of the Chinese consumers started to gain much, much more in volume. And more importantly, um, this is something I think we all need to keep in mind. Today, we are looking at the audience and the consumers. We're talking about young people. But the young people then was too young. <laughs> and China came out of the Cultural Revolution, going through the 80s. It was a, a change that was gradual, but not so easy to translate into consumption or general affluence or taste, etc., etc. So we are talking about literally people who have been born since 1980 that has been a driving force of what we see today. Now, this is year 2019. This is actually, uh, as I said, 40 years after. And very importantly, this is a moment, a very important turning point because the Chinese population, 1.34 billion people, this is a turning point that people born since 1980 is beginning to be bigger, more than 50%, 51% this year, than people born in China before the economic reform. So you think about it. This country is entering a phase of uh, extremely important turning point that the younger generation in China, shaped by the economic reform, meaning since the birth of their time, they have seen nothing else but economic growth. And this is the generation that is shaping fashion. This is a generation that has brought us to where we are now today. And that's important because this is what um, I think what we can look forward to because uh, the China yesterday, today is literally turning overwhelmingly into China today and tomorrow. So all this is to just categorically <laughs> answer that yeah. question. So there was a day, there was a period that actually it was a little noticed. Hardly anybody was paying attention. And you had the government department stores maybe learning about it. And you had department stores selling economics, uh, s selling uh, uh, cosmetics maybe, and mm -hmm. pr progressively moving into fashion. So what we probably may take for granted today actually did not exist at all at all, 25 years ago. And I it's, it's probably in that sense. So you so cannot imagine the contrast. I'm, I'm interested, you, you, s you speak mm. about these, you know, everyone's talking about these Chinese millennial consumers, right? They're mm -hmm. driving the growth in the industry, um, you know, more than any other consumer segment maybe. How, in, in what ways is their mindset different from their parents? You're saying that, you know, the ones that have been born since 1980, you know, they're reaching their, their late 30s or... 39 you know, years yeah, old. Yeah, they're 39 <laughs> years old. <laughs> Turning now. 40 so next year. Yeah, their mm. parents now, you know, they're... What is the biggest difference between the way they think about life and luxury and consumption versus their parents? I think that probably need to divide it into different groups. The probably the, the, the first wave would be represented by people who were born in 1980s. Yeah who are now pushing 40. So this, is, this would be considered the first wave. And the first wave probably will be represented by, I remember reading about it, there's a very famous Chinese writer by the name of Han Han. And he wrote in his blog uh, article, I remember 2011 or 12. And he was reflecting on something, not deliberately on fashion, but he mentioned the word fashion did not exist to him in the Chinese vocabulary until 2000. Really? He said that. Of course, probably little noticed by most other people, but I was taken. Right. Because don't forget, I started uh, working for Elvermich uh, in 1993 in China. So it was very obvious 
the work that was being done in the 1990s was educational, preparing, but not necessarily translating into a force of influence until the people who were born in the 1980s turned into 20s, right? or late 20s, uh, basically it happened probably uh, after the year 2000. That's why it's so interesting for Han Han to have mentioned that the word uh, uh, fashion did not exist in Chinese vocabulary until after that. So this was the first force. So this first force was interesting because as this generational segment moved on, don't forget now they are pushing 40, now you have a younger generation coming in, the generation segment who was born uh, in 1990s, uh, who are now in their 20s. So now, a, a wave after wave of pushing, so now you see this situation whereby the first segment probably was so um, uh, unmentored, because their parents were from the Cultural Revolution, they, they could literally almost have no, uh, um, uh, nobody ahead of them. So whatever they were doing, they think they, they probably were uh, doing everything right, but they were, don't forget, unmentored. Right. But then you now move to the next segment, the, the segment of, uh, of generation who were born in the 1990s, and their parents probably currently are still working in their 50s or whatever, and many of them successful. So you have some mentoring, and then, of course, they are going to be pushed by people who were born in at the turn of the, uh, the, the new century, wh which is actually now pushing 20. So you have this situation accelerating the change. So this educational element that used to be uh, unmentored un now is both mentored and stimulated by people who are younger. So th th that explains how the, you know, the acceleration uh, of the change that happens. Now, contrasting other countries or other nations, no, uh, no country uh, has a shortage of different generations. But the context of China is that because of the Cultural Revolution, because of the closed door situation for 30 years, this explosion, this uh, pent-up demand, this passion that exists with the young people, probably, to me, is unprecedented and unrivaled uh, if you compare to other nations. If you look at Japan, um, obviously, it's an aging population. It has at least three, four generations of consumers who are already, you know, with this. And if you look at Europe, look at America, um, uh, the same. Uh, I think especially if you look at America, if we compare to China, we're talking about emerged middle class, yes. But if you're talking about the absolute number, it's similar. Maybe it's at minimum 120 million Chinese people middle class. And therefore you say, well, it's uh, like the US or like Japan. But no, because the Chinese middle class are very young. Right. Probably in their 20s and 30s, well, the average age of the Japanese middle class is probably 65. Right. And the American ones, uh, yes, but they are not feeling that they are doing better than their grandparents or their parents. So therefore, the feeling, the positive feeling, has everything to do with this Chinese middle class, not just emerged, but almost purely young people. So that, I think, is probably the fundamental difference. Uh, the so accelerated that, ex that explains know, why every time I come here it feels like everything's changing so quickly. Yes. In a market where the consumer is advancing at such a rapid pace, where the market context is changing so quickly, what do you advise people, like entrepreneurs? You know, we have entrepreneurs here from you know, international markets, we have entrepreneurs here from China. How do you connect with a consumer in the context where the market is so fast? I think the question is not how first, it's you do need to connect because this is a country that the notion of B2C is relatively new. If you look at the country of China's change for the last 40 years, well, as I mentioned in the early, early 80, in the 80s, uh, you were talking about exporting. So that's not B2C, you're you are talking about B2, B2B business. And B2B business is probably, uh, has dominated much of China's economic reform. Mixed with also B2G, because you're selling to the government. <laughs> the, don't forget the, the GDP growth in China uh, for a long time was driven by government investment, infrastructure and all that. So this whole notion of B2C is so new that it's not automa automatically in Chinese entrepreneurs' 
mind. But things are changing. If you look at uh, 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 e-commerce, that's a B2C business. If you look at a lot of uh, internet setups today, that's mostly B2C. So this B2C movement is new, but we also need to take care of that, not take for granted that it's already with our people uh, or Chinese designers who are in it. I think there was a at least a moment that you almost felt that some of the Chinese designers just wanted to win awards. But do they connect with the consumers? So therefore, you know, connecting with the consumers is a notion in China that should not be taken for granted. It's something that is happening. I see younger generation of Chinese designers more and more embracing it, and that's the right way to go about it. And this is so important because until unless you connect with the consumers, just having a design, uh, uh, something that could uh, win awards, as you know, um, uh, it doesn't necessarily make a business. And uh, in, in the end, it's not an award-winning competition. It's the contest vis-a-vis -vis the consumers. The consumers are the ultimate um, sort of judge and, and uh, endorser and, 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 in fact, the force to, to make or break a, a concept or, or business. So I think that probably uh, precedes the notion of how. Okay, so now tell us how. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually, I would uh, not uh, be right to pretend that I know how. Okay. I think it, the how is in the game of, of engage, engagement, and actually there's no right answer, one right answer for everyone. There's nothing wrong if a Chinese uh, designer wants to design and win non-Chinese audience. Nothing wrong if you make it work. So that's one way you could uh, be a Chinese designer and become a very big force in America or in Europe or, or anywhere. So not necessarily there's a defined uh, sort of uh, uh, a consumer uh, that you have to go after, but you have to go after someone not just uh, winning an award. So with that, then it, it becomes uh, the how goes into where. So if you look at China, are you looking at Shanghai area? Or you're looking at Mongolia? Are you looking at Beijing area? So there's a lot of differences, uh, uh, I think, even within China. You could connect with someone and not connect with the others. So I think that's very important, but the key is you need to connect. You need to connect with consumers. Large, big, small, it's different because for maybe investors, the people like to see scalability and immediately you serve uh, a, bi a billion Chinese consumers. If you could do it, it's all good. But it doesn't mean there's anything wrong if you're connecting with 200 consumers or 2,000 consumers or 200,000 consumers. Look at Shanghai. It's a city of 25 million people. So a 25 million population city is the size of Australia, the size of Canada, yeah. and the size of uh, uh, bigger than many European countries. So uh, nothing wrong with that. Um, yeah. and, and if you look at, uh, again, more specifically, the, the greater Shanghai area, this is an incredibly affluent uh, neighborhood, if you may. Uh, within one hour, you get to Hangzhou, which is another mega city. Uh, within one and a half hours, probably, you reach Nanjing, and etc. So um, this is really something that you really need to specifically look at rather than just look at China as if it's just uh, a, a uniformed uh, 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 market. And of course, uh, we, we know the general Chinese economy's growth is slowing down. Last year was at 6.6%, the slowest probably uh, that we can remember. But don't forget, the, the scale is so big, 6.6% growth last year. Guess what? It translates into the total GDP of Australia. So China grew in and year. Australia yeah. in one, one year. So uh, that's something to think about, <laughs> the scale. And of course, n this year, at minimum, China is going to grow probably 6%. Yeah, but that's another something, perhaps another Australia, right? right. So, <laughs> um, and also consumption. I know that uh, uh, many people talk about last year, probably the general consumption is the slowest growing at a single digit at probably 9%. But you know that the scale of consumption in China that is so big, 9% growth 
the absolute amount of gross or the absolute amount of gross is literally equal to the whole consumption about 10 years ago of China, 1998 right. or something. So it, this, this is huge. Yeah. So we are talking about a market that is differentiated growth now. Yeah, you, you will be lucky if you are carried by the general growth, but there's nothing wrong when the general growth is slowing down, but you can grow triple or quadruple digit. So I think that also is important. So not one approach, but you need to be obviously very, very uh, focused on connecting with the consumers, and you find the right vehicles, right, right distributions, there's more and more choices. The e-commerce, the, you know, uh, the, the traditional, or the merge, the O2O, et cetera. And uh, uh, there are so many tools, uh, uh, in, in many cases, much more advanced in, in many parts of the world. Yeah, one, one of the things I did want to touch upon was the role of technology in, in this you know, kind of connection or going after these market opportunities. I mean, for those of us from the West, you know, when we're here and we like download WeChat on our phone and we see just everything that WeChat can do, because WeChat's kind yes. of like, you know, a combination of like Apple Pay, Facebook, Instagram, like it's like everything combined. And in the West now, you know, Mark Zuckerberg says that he's, he's consolidating the messaging of uh, WhatsApp and Instagram. You know, they're trying to catch up with the technology here. Yes. What, you know, and you sit in a very interesting position, you know, as part of this, you know, large global group. When, when you see technology uh, in this country, how is that changing the market here? The way big brands or, or, or small brands go after the market opportunity? Because clearly when you have things like WeChat, um, it's a game changer. Yes, I think uh, I'm not a technology person, <laughs> so <laughs> I cannot comment on technology, but I can say one thing. Uh, people probably far away, or people even living in the environment, all become acutely aware of the air pollution and, and the smog and all those, all, all of which is true. But technology has become the new air in China. So you are literally uh, uh, living in an environment that technology is the new air. So you cannot avoid it. You are breathing this and you, it becomes part of you. And I don't think anybody operating in China can uh, either refuse or, or, or pretend that it's not there. So you are really uh, 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 sort of breathing it and, and see it as part of the ecosystem, and this is already becoming uh, very much an integrated sort of uh, 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 ecosystem, uh, 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 part of that that uh, uh, you know that uh, gathers the attra att attraction or, or the attention of the consumers. So again, it's all about connecting. How do you connect with the consumers? Uh, um, without uh, 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 without the technology that is already being embraced by everyone because it has everything to do with the fact that China is driven by this uh, movement of youths. And therefore, it ad adapts and adopts new things, adapts to and adopts new things faster, more readily, probably than other places. Plus, there's this passionate component. So it's really not something that I can specifically comment, but uh, without any doubt, it's, it's really the becoming the air that we breathe. Mm. Um, we're almost out of time. Before, before um, we conclude, uh, you know, and you mentioned this earlier, which is that, you know, there's not a single type of Chinese consumer, right? There's, but what do you, if you were going to advise the people here in this group, um, you know, what is the single most misunderstood thing about reaching and connecting with the Chinese consumer? What, what, what advice do you, would you give to people to kind of overcome in their mindsets about, about the consumers here in China? I think to be able to connect with the Chinese consumer, you really need to pay a lot of attention to the changes that are happening in China. Uh, that probably are uh, underlying uh, the behavior or the, you know, the motivating uh, the people, how they behave. So you cannot just uh, look at the person. There are plenty of overseas Chinese that you can look at and say, okay, so you are Chinese, I assume. By looking at you, I understand. Yeah, but that's not in the right context, right? Sometimes the Chinese people overseas present one view or the other of the Chinese, all true, but not necessarily... Uh, uh, 
sufficient for you to understand. Hong Kong sits next to mainland China, as close as any other location could, or the closest. Hong Kong sees probably 50 million mainland Chinese visits a year, probably contribute probably uh, hugely to Hong Kong's retail more than any other forces. But does Hong Kong understand mainland Chinese by looking at the people in, on Canton Road? Do they understand enough? And I would say, not just by looking at them on Canton Road, I would say that's not sufficient. Because even when you see a lot of Chinese, well, they behave differently when they are on Canton Road, and you probably don't know where they come from, what motivates them to buy, and you cannot really do much if they don't come, and there's not much you can drag them. So therefore, by looking at just at the Chinese is not sufficient. So therefore, how? Uh, I think uh, the danger, what you, I, I cannot say what is right, I can say what is wrong. You should not just take the easy way and say, oh, I just uh, recruit two Chinese students who are studying there, so I assume they represent the whole of China. Yeah. Be careful, because those two Chinese may be very poor in Chinese, and they learn English, and they may not speak even as good Chinese, or at, at least they may not write Chinese as well. So you really need to have a uh, much more humble and more open-minded approach how you are going to understand the Chinese rather than just the take it easy. Last year, the biggest uh, Hollywood movie about Chinese was Crazy Rich Asians. Mm -hmm. Very big, but very small, flopped in China. Did you know that? Why? Because it's not Chinese, it's Singaporean Chinese. Right. Most mainland Chinese probably do not feel a real connection. Right. And in the movie, e even when they attempted to speak Chinese, the mainland Chinese probably would laugh because actually you can obviously tell they are ABCs or whatever. So all these little things are very telling because if you're just far away, look at China thinking it's just, oh, you're Chinese, and uh, you do things with good intentions, sometimes it it doesn't connect. Right. <laughs> so I think uh, we collectively, internationally, need to make a, 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 a bigger effort to try to better understand the Chinese. And of course, it's also uh, a, a very important period or the starting part time that China need to also help the world understand China better. So this is on the shoulder of all of us, especially Chinese who are maybe uh, uh, internationally minded or bilingual. So th there's a lot of work to do. I think it's right. both ways. It's not just one way. Okay, well, th thank you for educating us. I mean, you're doing a great job at building that bridge. And I think, you know, for me, one of the lessons is that you just have to come visit the market more. Yes. You know, like being present here. There's nothing like being on the ground here in China, talking to people, seeing what people are wearing, understanding what people are interested in culturally, what they're talking about in terms of what's going on in the world, the best way is to come here and talk to people like you. So thank, thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.